Thank you very much, appreciate it. So if we ask what's new in neuroendocrine tumors, the answer is quite a lot. Uh, in fact, looking back at the last decade, um, you'll notice that there have been nine published uh, phase three studies, seven of which have actually been positive, have met their primary endpoint. So perhaps not unprecedented, but certainly very rare in, um, in cancer. But if we think of neuroendocrine tumors in the landscape, we're not talking about one cancer. We're talking about a heterogeneous group of cancers, a very diverse group of cancers. If you consider the fact that neuroendocrine tumors range from the very slowest, most indolent uh, growing solid tumors to the very most aggressive, fast growing neoplasms. And there are multiple ways of kind of slicing and dicing the, the field, but here are some ways we categorize them uh, based on tumor volume, tumor extent, whether it's widely metastatic or liver dominant, as many neuroendocrine tumors are, uh, whether the pace of growth is slow or rapid. Uh, primary site is, of course, and a very important uh, factor to consider. Uh, we often separate between pancreatic and non-pancreatic because the biological differences are quite clear, but actually every single primary site has its own unique biology, and even very, very close uh, sites in proximity, like appendix and, and uh, ileocecum, have a vastly different um, uh, clinical behavior and biology. Uh, we distinguish based on grade. The difference between low-grade tumors and high-grade tumors is, is dramatic. Um, differentiation is similar, but not exactly the same as grade. It refers to the extent to which the endocrine cells, uh, the, the cancer cells re resemble the endocrine cells of origin. And a well-differentiated tumor behaves quite differently and responds to different treatments from a poorly differentiated tumor. Uh, we look at whether tumors are hormonally functional, meaning hormone producing, producing syndromes such as the carcinoid syndrome, or non-functional, non-hormone producing. And, uh, and the last thing we look at is uh, somatostatin receptor expression, because some tumors express very high levels of somatostatin receptors, others don't, and this has important therapeutic implications. So it's a very diverse uh, group of diseases. And it's important to consider this because when we talk about different treatments, we're almost never talking about treatments that pertain to the entire family of neuroendocrine tumors. Some of them cross uh, various categories, but some are very specific. Uh, and the categories include somatostatin analogs, which are offering the cornerstone first-line therapy uh, for patients with somatostatin receptor-expressing tumors. Uh, mTOR inhibitors, particularly everolimus, are used in various uh, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. These are vascular tumors, so angiogenic, anti-angiogenic treatment is, is often uh, quite active. Uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy plays a role in certain types of neuroendocrine tumors. There's this emerging field of radio-labeled somatostatin analogs, also known as peptide receptor therapy. Uh, telotristat is a drug that was just approved two weeks ago that doesn't actually target tumor growth, but rather is a seroto serotonin synthesis inhibitor. So it, uh, it targets release of serotonin in patients with carcinoid syndrome. And then finally, there's liver-directed therapy, which, despite its importance, I won't have time to talk about today. So let's start with somatostatin analogs. And these have been around for, for decades. They were initially developed to control hormonal syndromes, particularly uh, uh, control uh, symptoms associated with the carcinoid syndrome. This New England Journal of Medicine uh, study on octreotide and carcinoid syndrome was published in 1985. Now, it was not, not long after that that clinicians started noticing that somatostatin analogs also inhibit tumor growth. But it actually took 25 years to prove this. And this proof came in the form of the PROMIT study, which is actually the first randomized placebo-controlled phase three study in the whole field of neuroendocrine tumors. And it randomized patients with long-acting octreotide versus placebo in patients with low-grade mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors, neuroendocrine tumors starting in the uh, small intestine and proximal colon. And even though the response rates were, were negligible, uh, there was a clear improvement in time to progression uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.34, proving that somatostatin analogs, in addition to controlling hormonal syndromes, also inhibited tumor growth. The next phase three study of a somatostatin analog was the clarinet study of lanreotide, long-acting lanreotide, uh, which looked at a more heterogeneous population of non-functioning enteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So not just small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, but also pancreatic, colorectal, um, all of which were non-functioning, non-hormone producing, and all of which which expressed somatostatin receptors, and all of whom had K67 index less than 10%, so low and low intermediate grade. 
Now, it's an interesting feature of the design that prior to randomization, they were actually observed for three to six months uh, to assess their progression status. And you can see here, as far as baseline characteristics, that the plurality of tumors originated in the pancreas, uh, the reason being that many pancreatic nets are non-functioning as opposed to mid-gut nets, which are typically functioning in the metastatic setting. Uh, and if you look at the baseline tumor progression status, virtually all of them had relatively stable disease at baseline. Only about 5% had, had, had progression of disease be prior to randomization. And these are the progression-free uh, survival curves. You can see that the hazard ratio was 0.47. It was highly statistically significant. Uh, perhaps interestingly, the median PFS on the placebo arm was 18 months, which is unusually long even by neuroendocrine tumor standards. So this was a, a really quite indolent population of patients, perhaps because uh, one of the reasons being that they did require this period of observation prior to treatment. Uh, but it was much longer on the uh, lenreotide arm. And if we look at uh, individual subgroups, and this trial really wasn't powered to look at individual subgroups, but if we look at mid-gut, the hazard ratio of 0.35 is virtually identical to what was seen in the PROMID study, suggesting that the uh, activity of octreotide and lanreotide are quite similar. And in pancreatic nets, the hazard ratio was 0.58, so not quite as good, but certainly uh, strongly suggesting that the drug works in this population as well. So where do somatostatin analogs fit in? Well, they seem to be active in a, a heterogeneous group of neuroendocrine tumors as long as they express somatostatin receptors, which most well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors do. Uh, they seem to be quite similar in their activity. Um, the anti-proliferative activity seems to be strongest in tumors originating in the mid-gut. Um, and based on the clarinet trial, the very long period of uh, PFS on the placebo arm we can say that perhaps observation is appropriate for a certain select population of patients who have low volume disease, who have slow growing tumors to start with, who are asymptomatic. Now, anyone who has experience with somatostatin analog knows that these are extremely safe drugs, extremely well tolerated drugs on average. And so, um, based on the, you know, the, the, the activity as well as the toxicity profile, these are appropriate first line agents for most patients with well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. And we think that they're probably most active in patients with low proliferative activity versus high. There's some debate over whether volume of disease uh, impacts um, activity. I think that volume is probably, in some cases, a surrogate for proliferation and aggressiveness. I don't think that by itself it's a prognostic factor. Um, and certainly, um, uh, they're, they're only thought to be appropriate in patients who express somatostatin receptors, which we can detect with Octrea scans. And now, more recently, there's a new somatostatin receptor test called a Gallium-68 dotatate scan, which is even more sensitive. Another very important pathway in neuroendocrine tumors is the mTOR pathway. Um, we know that about 15% of pancreatic nets express discrete mutations in mTOR pathway enzymes, such as um, PIK3CA or P10. Uh, the number is lower in non-pancreatic nets, but in fact, if we look at phosphorylation of downstream enzymes, um, it seems that the pathway is, is active even in patients without identifiable discrete mutations, and certainly the activity of mTOR inhibitors does not seem to be confined to that population. So one of the first studies of uh, oral mTOR inhibitor of Rolimus in pancreatic nets was the Radiant-1 study, um, which... Um, showed a relatively low objective response rate, but a relatively high rate of stable disease. Uh, this led to the Radiant 3 trial, a randomized phase 3 study comparing Everolimus to placebo in patients with progressive advanced pancreatic nets. There was crossover at time of progression. And these are the PFS curves uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.35, highly statistically significant. And these are the overall survival curves, with the important caveat that this trial was not powered to um, evaluate overall survival, as is the case with, with pretty much all the phase three trials in this field. Uh, but there was a trend towards improved um, uh, overall survival. And again, it's important to emphasize the crossover design. Now, there are a myriad group of uh, adverse events with um, um, uh, with Everolimus, which include 
uh, stomatitis, uh, basically aphthous ulcers in the mouth, uh, rash, increased risk of infection. It is an immunosuppressive drug, um, sometimes peripheral edema, pneumonitis, uh, diarrhea, uh, hyperglycemia, uh, decreased um, uh, blood count. So, you know, these can be challenging side effects. I think it's important to consider uh, these side effects when prescribing the drug, particularly in patients who are older or frail. Most patients can tolerate the drug, however, with, with dose reductions, and dose reductions are necessary in, in many, if not most, patients. The Radiant 2 study was a parallel study that uh, took place in patients with non-pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, in other words, carcinoid tumors, uh, that um, uh, were hormonally functioning, in other words, with a history of carcinoid syndrome. And the reason it was restricted to hormonally functioning tumors was that they wanted uh, to use um, octreotide LAR in both groups. So it was basically octreotide LAR plus everolimus versus octreotide LAR uh, um, versus placebo. And at the time, octreotide was only approved for its uh, anti-secretory effect. Again, the study had crossover at time of progression. So these are the PFS curves for the Radian 2 trial, and it's pretty obvious that they're not as impressive as what we saw in the Radian 3 trial. The hazard ratio was just 0.77. And the p-value in this trial was 0 0.026, which fell just short of the statistically significant threshold of 0 0.024. So in a very technical sense, this was a negative trial. Although it's important to emphasize that probably uh, the trial was negative, and uh, um, one reason the trial was negative was the fact that there was discrepancy between local investigator determination of progression and central radiology determination of progression, and central radiology was the primary endpoint. So there were cases where the local investigator said there was progression, took the patient off the trial, but the central radiologist said this patient has not quite progressed by resist. And so those patients were censored, leading to a loss of statistical significance. Still, when we look at the overall survival curve, we see a hazard ratio of 1.05, which is not particularly encouraging when you see um, a numerically better survival in the placebo arm versus the active arm. And again, there, there's the standard caveats. This was not powered for overall survival. Um, there was crossover. Uh, but still, I think it, it brings home the point that we have to be very careful uh, with use of these drugs, particularly in patients with mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors that tend to be quite slow growing. Um, we have to consider the risk versus benefit ratio very carefully because you know, there are some patients where this drug can actually cause mortality. So the final piece of the puzzle was the Radiant 4 study. So this looked at non-pancreatic, non-functioning neuroendocrine tumors. And because most mid-gut, metastatic mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors are hormonally functioning, we're talking here about a more diverse population that includes a lot of lung neuroendocrine tumors, colorectal, gastric, duodenal, so kind of a, uh, a, a hodgepodge of um, relatively uncommon, uh, well-differentiated nets. All of whom had progressed. This time they want to see radiologic progression in six months. Uh, and this time, unlike the previous two radiant trials, there was no crossover. So the goal was to at least see a, a trend, perhaps, in overall survival benefit. And this time, the hazard ratios uh, were, were more notable. The hazard ratio was 0.48. And you can see this was a relatively aggressive population. The median PFS on the placebo arm was four months. Also in this trial, uh, we're actually seeing a trend <clears throat> towards improved overall survival. Now, the p-value is 0 0.037, which, which seems significant, but this is an interim analysis of overall survival, so the, the threshold for significance is quite high. The mature data is not, yet, uh, is not yet published. So where does everolimus fit in? Well, it seems to be active in a heterogeneous population of gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. It's probably more active in non-midgut versus midgut, and I think this is really a factor of the fact that so many midgut neuroendocrine tumors are, are really exceptionally slow growing, and, and you have to have clinically significant progression uh, to be able to see benefit with this, with this drug. And when we, with respect to elderly or frail patients, patients with relatively poor performance status, uh, we have to be quite uh, careful uh, when using this drug. So when I see a patient with, a, for example, a metastatic liver predominant mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor with 
you know, relatively low volume disease and just minimal progression, this is not necessarily the drug that I would think about. But if you take a lung net or a pancreatic net, it's actually really growing, certainly an active drug. What about sunitinib? Well, we know that neuroendocrine tumors are quite vascular. They're actually thought to be the second most vascular solid tumor after renal cell carcinoma, and so it's not surprising that uh, angiogenesis inhibitors have activity. But in fact, the only um, um, agent that has progressed to a phase three study and has been positive um, is, is sunitinib, which was compared to placebo in patients with progressive pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So a study design and eligibility criteria that were virtually identical to radian 3. Response rates were slightly under 10%, again, identical to what we see with Everolimus. And the PFS curves are identical to what we saw with uh, radian 3. So improvement in median PFS from roughly 5 months to 11 months with a hazard ratio of 0.4. The adverse event profile is different from Everolimus. I, 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 can't say that it's, it's better or worse, it's just different. Patients uh, on sunitinib are likely to experience diarrhea, they experience hand-foot syndrome, hypertension, slightly increased risk of cardiovascular events, fatigue is an important side effect, uh, but you know, whether this com uh, compares favorably or poorly to Everolimus, I think, is a, is a judgment call. So how do we choose among the drugs in pancreatic nets where both are approved? Um, you know, in most cases, it's a matter of preference, uh, but sometimes patient uh, comorbidities can help influence treatment uh, decisions. So moving on to a relatively newer field of peptide receptor radiotherapy, or radio-labeled somatostatin analogs, which rely on the fact that most well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors express high levels of somatostatin receptors, and so by um, attaching a radionuclide to a somatostatin analog, you can selectively target um, a somatostatin receptor expressing uh, tumors. So the first generation uh, isotope used was indium-111. This is the same isotope that's used in Octrea scans. It's primarily a gamma emitter, and gamma emission really doesn't result in any cytotoxicity, but it also emits Auger electrons, which are weakly cytotoxic, very short tissue penetration, um, and so it's not surprising that the uh, level of cytotoxicity is quite low with this particular isotope. Uh, the next generation was yttrium-90, which was a, a beta emitter with a relatively uh, long tissue penetration of 12 millimeters, uh, perhaps a little bit too long because it can cause cytotoxicity outside of the target tumor. And more recently, lutetium-177 uh, with a tissue penetration range of about 2 millimeters and a longer half-life. So, until recently, data with this form of treatment has come from a variety of single-arm studies and institutional registries. Um, if you'll notice on the top of this table, uh, with indium-111-based uh, therapies, uh, response rates have been quite low, single digits. Uh, with yttrium-90, it's been quite diverse. Not all of these studies have looked at resist response, and they've looked at different populations. And on average, the response rates seem to be higher uh, with lutetium-177 um, rate-based radio-labeled somatostatin analogs, with the largest series of 310 patients uh, published in uh, 2008 uh, coming from Rotterdam, where this, um, um, where this type of therapy was developed initially. With respect to progression-free survival, median progression-free survival, again, the data comes from institutional registries and, and uh, multicenter single-arm studies. It's quite diverse, but definitely longer than what we've seen with other forms of therapy uh, in the second-line setting. Although it is important to emphasize with these studies, not all patients had progressive disease at baseline. Most did, but not all. And not surprisingly, there seems to be a relationship between radio tracer uptake, which we can measure with somatostatin receptor imaging, and objective response rate. And this was demonstrated in at least one study. So the Netter 1 study was the first randomized phase 3 perspective study uh, to try to evaluate this type of uh, treatment with a high level of evidence. Uh, 
Um, the population was uh, patients with mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors, again, patients with nets originating in the small intestine and, uh, and cecum, often in the ileocecal area. Um, they all had progressive disease at baseline, although that progression could have occurred over a period as long as three years. All had evidence of somatostatin receptor expression on Octrea scan, and they were randomized to receive lutetium-177 dotatate at a fixed dose, 200 millicuries each treatment for four treatments. Each treatment is given eight weeks apart uh, versus high-dose octreotide, octreotide LAR, 60 milligrams every four weeks. And this particular control arm was studied, was chosen because there was really no um, standard systemic therapy with, that was thought to be active um, in this disease. Primary endpoint was progression-free survival by blinded central radiology review. And you can see that there was a significant improvement in PFS. It was, in fact, not reached on the uh, lutetium uh, dotatate arm versus eight months with high-dose octreotide and a hazard ratio of 0.21, which was highly statistically significant. When it comes to response rates, the objective response rate was 18% with lutetium versus 3% uh, with high-dose octreotide. And I think it's important to note that we've not seen double-digit response rates with any other systemic form of therapy in, in mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors. You can certainly achieve higher response rates with liver embolization, uh, but not, uh, not with systemic uh, drugs. With respect to overall survival, there were nearly half as many deaths on the lutetian arm versus high-dose octreotide with their hazard ratio of 0.4. Uh, but just as we talked about with the Radiant 4 study, this is an interim analysis of overall survival. It's not a mature analysis, and so the threshold for statistical significance is, well, it has, it has a lot of zeros after the P. So this is, on a technical level, not statistically significant, but, uh, but encouraging. So where does PRT uh, fit in? Um, well, the phase three data exists only in mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors, but um, single-arm data suggests even higher response rates uh, in other neuroendocrine tumors, especially pancreatic nets, although the median time to progression is, is likely shorter in non-mid-gut nets simply because they tend to be more aggressive at baseline. Uh, we think that somatostatin receptor expression is a strong predictive marker, although that didn't quite pan out on the Netter study. Uh, it's not a first-line therapy for most patients. It can be considered a second-line therapy. Somatostatin, uh, non-radio labeled somatostatin analogs are still safer, um, and there's a much longer history of experience with those drugs. Uh, the advantages are a limited treatment course. It's only four treatments given over eight months very long progression-free survival, relatively low toxicity, although there are some concerns. Uh, for example, if we look at institutional registries, there seems to be about a 1% to 2% rate of um, long-term uh, bone marrow toxicity, which is either myelodysplasia or acute leukemia. As far as nephrotoxicity, it's a concern. It's more of a concern with yttrium-90-based treatments. If you use protective amino acids with lutetium, uh, the nephrotoxicity rate seems to be negligible. What about cytotoxic chemotherapy? Well, platinum-based chemotherapy is certainly the standard of care for poorly differentiated neuroendocrine cancers. Uh, there's probably not much activity in mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors, but there's increasing consensus that uh, alkylating agents uh, are quite active in pancreatic nets. And um, in the past, streptozosin was um, the alkylating-based uh, drug of choice. More recently, uh, temozolomide has emerged as a active and relatively well-tolerated drugs. Uh, now the data is not, the level of evidence is not high. The data predominantly comes from small subsets of phase two studies um, and uh, from retrospective series. But uh, the response rates to temozolomide-based combinations and the studies have almost always been combinations rather than single uh, agent temozolomide have been roughly 50%. And this is some examples from a, a series that we published uh, nearly 10 years ago with capecitamine temozolomide, just showing examples of response. And these are the kinds of responses in pancreatic nets that you will only see with cytotoxic chemotherapy. Uh, you, you rarely see these with targeted agents, and, and even with PRRT, you'll, you'll rarely see this kind of um, response. And it's primarily seen in patients with relatively aggressive um, uh, tumors. And these are not poorly differentiated tumors, but for the most part, part patients with tumors that are active in a proliferative sense. 
The data thus far has been a relatively low level of evidence. Fortunately, there is a randomized ECOG trial looking at temozolomide monotherapy versus capecitabine temozolomide. Uh, primary endpoint is progression-free survival. Uh, the, the study has actually completed accrual last year, and hopefully uh, the initial results will come out either this year or next year. And so this is going to be a very important trial, both to really get a good sense of the response rate in PFS and also to figure out whether the um, combination uh, is um, both superior and uh, fairly toler equally tolerable compared to monotherapy. So where do tumizolomide-based regimens fit in? Well, primarily in pancreatic nets. There seems to be a little bit less activity in lung or colorectal nets. In midgut nets, I've yet to see an objective response, although you know, we sometimes see activity in patients with relatively aggressive tumors. And they probably are more appropriate in more proliferatively active tumors and faster-growing tumors, although that's really based more on experience than on actual data. When we looked at our series of nearly 150 patients, we actually could not establish that these were prognostic uh, uh, predictive factors. And there's a lot of controversy whether deficiency in the DNA repair enzyme MGMT uh, predicts response to tumazolamide-based chemotherapy. And last, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about telotristat, which is a drug that was just approved two weeks ago. It's not an anti-tumor drug, it's a drug that inhibits serotonin synthesis, and it works by inhibiting tryptophan hydroxylate, which is the first rate-limiting enzyme in conversion of tryptophan uh, to serotonin. So the Stellastar study was a small phase three study which compared uh, telotristat uh, to placebo in patients with carcinoid syndrome and diarrhea uh, because the diarrhea seems to, in carcinoid syndrome seems to be primarily mediated by serotonin. Flushing seems to be more multifactorial. There's a lot of vasoactive substances that contribute to flushing. Uh, but diarrhea seems to be more related directly to serotonin. And so the primary endpoint was reduction in diarrhea, a little bit of an unusual endpoint. And this uh, graph uh, illustrates reduction in bowel movements. And you can see that on average, there was about a uh, 0.5 reduction in bowel movements on placebo versus about 1.5 at the 12-week time point uh, with telotristat. And this was statistically significant. So you can say, well, perhaps reduction in one bowel mov movement per day uh, numerically is not that impressive. But if you ask patients, at least in a, in a certain subset, there seems to be a significant improvement in quality of life that seems to be beyond what you'd expect with a relatively modest reduction in, in bowel movements. The drug is a serotonin inhibitor, so it's encouraging that we saw significant reductions in levels of urine 5-HIAA, which is a metabolite of serotonin. So the drug actually works the way it's supposed to. And as far as adverse events, um, the drug seems to be exceptionally well tolerated. There may be a little bit of nausea. We're always concerned about mood changes uh, when it comes to serotonin inhibitors because serotonin is an important neurotransmitter. But in fact, this drug does not seem to cross the blood-brain barrier and, and has negligible effect on, on depression. So where does telotristat fit in? Well, it's active in controlling diarrhea from carcinoid syndrome. Is there inherent advantage in targeting the specific pathophysiology? Can you achieve similar results with emodium or lamotil or tincture of opium? Well, most of those drugs don't work that well in diarrhea related to carcinoid syndrome. So I think the answer is yes. And I think it does produce some quality of life benefits beyond uh, just modest reduction in diarrhea control. The important question is, does this reduce the risk of carcinoid heart disease? Because fibrosis and thickening of the tricuspid and pulmonic valve seems to be directly related to levels of serotonin. The answer is probably yes, uh, but it's going to be very hard to prove. So to sum things up, um, when we look at treatment algorithm for non-pancreatic nets, and particularly midgut nets, who are progressing on somatostatin analog treatment, Options include everolimus. Um, options include peptide receptor radiotherapy, which will hopefully be approved later this year. And although I didn't have time to talk about liver-directed therapy, it's really quite active in treating liver uh, metastases and also in palliating uh, hormonal syndrome, syndromes associated with neuroendocrine tumors. For patients who are radiographically stable but have syndrome progression, you can consider escalating somatostatin analog uh, dose. It's not a strategy that's been well studied. And now for carcinoid syndrome, specifically diarrhea related to carcinoid syndrome, uh, telotristat is available. <laughs>
For pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors progressing on semi-atostatin analog, the landscape is more varied. There's about five categories of treatment, and if you ask five different experts, you may get five different answers as to what is the best next step. And so the challenge in the coming decade is to try to learn how to sequence these therapies. And I'm happy to say that there is at least uh, several studies that are currently looking at that, one study comparing chemotherapy to sinitinib, another study comparing uh, peptide receptor radiotherapy to everolimus. Thank you very much.